Channel 4 Now, witness examines the justice and fairness of Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, serving a life sentence. They buried the bodies not far from the road which crosses the high bleak hills of Saddleworth Moor. Five children died. Their killers got life. But that was 30 years ago. Today, Britain's longest serving woman prisoner waits to find out. Does life mean life? for Myra Hindley. Myra Hindley used to pass the house to go to her sister's, Maureen, and she'd say, good morning, Mr. Reed, good mo morning, Mrs. Reed. And she'd already done what she'd done to my daughter. And I, I never thought about it, never thought she had anything to do with it at all. And when I thought about it after, I just thought, how could she, how could she speak to me and know that she'd done that? Why is it 30 years on that everyone wants to believe she's still this monster? I do sense an injustice in this case. I'm not talking about the crimes because the crimes were terrible, but I'm talking about how a human being, a prisoner, is being treated 30 years on, and that's what disturbs me. Disturbs me as a human being, and it disturbs me as a lawyer. Two people were convicted of the Moore's murders. Ian Brady is now insane and unlikely ever to be released, but his former lover Myra Hindley is not mad. She's already served exactly twice the time of the average lifer. She wants her freedom, and any day now the Home Secretary has to decide how much longer she must stay behind bars. I think she is a political prisoner. She's there because the governments of either party are frightened of unpopularity if they let her out. She's not kept there because the judiciary says she should stay there, or the prison service, or the Doctors, nobody is saying she should stay there. Only the politicians are saying that. All I've ever said about Myra, and all I say now is, that she is entitled, as a human being, to the same treatment and the same consideration as every other life sentence prisoner. We should not treat her differently because the press choose to say things about her that are more heinous than they say about other murderers. We should make sure in our society that there's justice and fairness for her, as there is for everyone else. The time served by the average life prisoner is 14 and a half years. Myra Hindley has now done 29. Soon she'll know if she must serve the rest of her natural life. I think she should be set free again. That's just my opinion. That's all I have to say about it. No. No, definitely no. No, no she wants to stop where no. she is. Oh, never. Never. As soon as she steps out, that would be it. With the, you know, with all the relatives and what have you. I should think so. Because I would. It would have been my grandchild. She not only did a crime against, uh, against the laws of the land, but she did one against humanity as well, didn't she? I don't think she's fit to steal it out by herself. Drop her in the middle of this market for us. On Ashton Underline Market, people have long memories as well as strong opinions. It was here in November 1963 that one of the children disappeared. Anybody you stop on this market ground today or any other day, every single person will remember. 
at the time when he was missing the two years he was missing. I can remember trips in markets all over the country looking for him in case he had run away. There's no reason to run away, but in case he had. And that wasn't the case, as we all know. His name was John Kilbride, he was 11 years old. He was only a baby. He came here to work for pocket money, to help my mum out as much as himself. And he'd done it for a while, and then this happened, he just went with him. All we know is he didn't come home at tea time, like he normally did. And after a week went past, and then a month, a year, we, we knew, we knew, you know, he weren't coming back. They didn't find him for almost two years, and when they did, it was one of the biggest mass murder investigations Britain has ever seen. Hundreds of police officers dug up Saddleworth Moor, high in the Pennines east of Manchester. But it wasn't John Kilbride they found first. It was a little girl. The search began last Friday on the other side of this road, the A635, and late on Saturday afternoon they found the body of 10-year-old Leslie Downey face down in a shallow grave. Leslie Ann Downey had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Under the constant gaze of the television cameras, they kept on digging. And 11 days later, on the 27th of October, 1965, they brought the body of John Kilbride down off the moor. The chief detective came with a shoe for me to identify, which I knew right away it was John. And I was just stunned. I didn't cry. I just sat there feeling very sick. It was devastating, but it was the end of the waiting. At least I knew, you know, I wouldn't have to wait anymore. But it wasn't a nice end. It was a terrible end. I suppose in one way it was a relief. But to bury your brother at that age, it was, it was terrible. I remember the policeman coming. I think where everybody was just stunned. Nobody knows the full truth and what happened that day. We went missing, how long they kept him in the house before they did murder him. Nobody knows. They, they could have had him a week or a matter of hours. And nobody knows what they subjected him to. Your imagination does run away with you. I know how he was found. Not in a grave, in a hole, head first. With his feet nine inches from the top and his head thirty. I'll never forget that. I mean, people don't know how much I missed him. We shared a bedroom together. I wouldn't let none of my other brothers sleep in the room for a long time after. You know, I just wanted it to myself. It was just awful. Unbearable. Manchester was in mourning. Details were emerging about two other deaths. Rumours of a tape recording. All yesterday, detectives and sound recording engineers sat in a specially proofed studio in Manchester, picking out the noises and voices on that tape. It's thought there were four voices. One could be that of the dead girl, Leslie Downey, another of her killer. After listening to that tape, one police officer said, this case is beginning to rank as one of the most nauseating murder investigations. Leslie's father and uncle were waiting for the accused outside court. They knew the tape recorded the little girl's terrified protests as she was forced to take off her clothes and pose for pornographic photographs. Brady and Hindley were both charged with the murder of Leslie Ann Downey and of Edward Evans, 17, hacked to death in their house. In the case of John Kilbride, Hindley was also charged with harbouring Brady, knowing he'd killed the boy.
Capital punishment had been abolished in Britain just one month after the arrests. Everyone knew these killers would not hang. Sheila Kilbride went to court and looked the defendants in the face. Oh, I, I just felt very faint and sick. I just wanted to throw up. And my throat was choking. I'd been very brave and not cried, but after that, I, I just broke down that. Staring at them opposite me. Very cold. No heart, not sorry. No remorse. Bleached, blonde, oval hair, and dark makeup round the eyes. It was evil, just evil, piercing eyes. To look at her, it just made me blood run cold. I just felt sick inside. I just wanted to kill her. And I feel exactly the same way now after 31 years. No different at all. These were three calculated, cruel, and cold-blooded murders, was what Mr. Justice Fenton Atkinson said, and the, I passed the only sentence the law allowed. Then the police cleared the forecourt, and as a van with two white police cars escorting it swept through the archway of the castle, there was booing from a crowd which had gathered outside. The duration of their imprisonment is now entirely at the discretion of the Home Secretary. The Home Office said tonight that a life sentence means just what it says. Normal practice nowadays is to release a life prisoner on license after about 10 years. I'm going to visit my client, uh, Myra Hindley, at Cookenwood Prison. She served 30 years in jail. It's a terribly long time for any person to spend in prison. The courts recently ruled in favour of live prisoners that they are entitled to know how long they must spend in prison. The Home Secretary can no longer keep that from prisoners. That was a very important victory won by live prisoners. And that very, very soon, you'll have to tell Myra Hindley, is she going to be released or is she going to spend the rest of her life in jail? Well, I first met Myra Hindley at the end of 1968. I was already well known as a penal reformer. I'd been visiting prisoners. I'd begun to visit prisoners 30 years before. And she wrote to me because in my capacity of a penal reformer, saying she hoped I would call on her and try to help make it possible for her to meet Ian Brady, with whom she was still in love. That's how I first met her. The end of 68. And what first impression did you get? She was totally different from that awful Gorgon picture of the sort of very much like blonde with a skull on her face. I mean, totally different. You couldn't, unrecognisable. She was a quiet, um, um, courteous, um, uh, very pleasant girl. And then she was a young woman then. That's 20, 25 years ago. Of course, she's a middle-aged woman now. In her years in Holloway, Myra Hindley found women's supporters too like the singer Janie Jones, convicted of controlling prostitutes in 1974. She came to believe Myra Hindley was innocent. I couldn't believe it, because I was expecting something violent and something that looked, you know, really evil. But she was tall, she had hooded eyes, um, very cold eyes, but didn't look as though she could have committed the atrocities that she did. You know, she just looked like the girl who lived next door to you and she was very sort of gentle and very kind and she could be so nice and she said I have dreams where I've got grey hair, it's silver and I'm being wheeled out in a wheelchair out in front of the prison you know when I'm 65 and uh, it was very sad to listen to that you know and I thought well if she didn't take part in the crimes like she's telling me it's such a shame that she's in the, you know, uh, such torment. I left Holloway in May 77, and I started a campaign for Myra Hindley's freedom. I wanted to be Lynch Law. The campaign got off to a controversial start on BBC television. No, can I just stop? Do you think that she ought to be considered for parole? I really do. Myra has confessed from beginning to end and broken her heart and told me everything that happened. I don't think you... Lord Longford was there too, under attack from Anne West, mother of the murdered child, Leslie Ann Downey. 
Lord Longford is talking about parole for Myra Henley. When will I get parole? I am serving a life sentence through that monster. When will I get my parole? I've said this to Lord Longford once, and I'll say it again. She will be one dead woman. Mrs. West, for the moment. I want justice. For the moment, thank you very much. She may not like me, but I, I know Mrs. West, and I sympathise with her enormously, of course. But she'd been grossly exploited by the press, over, and the uh, mid uh, television too. Over the years, they, they trot her out, and on all these occasions, and I think it's a, I think that it's cool <laughs> behaving very coolly to her. I mean, to keep alive that degree of hatred, the corrosive hatred, the terrible thing. No, I'm tremendously sorry for her, but the idea of letting her decide my restraint would be ludicrous. Uh, I, in the early, early days, I got a lot of very unpleasant letters, but on this program, I can't use, quote, some of the language. And suddenly, you'd be shocked. The gentleman might know the words, and you mightn't know them. But I've been called an effing pervert, and that sort of thing, to my face. The Honourable David Astor now entered the fray. Yes. The ex-editor of The Observer became Myra Hindley's great supporter. He thought the popular press was unfair and irresponsible towards her. I knew Frank Longford from childhood, and I admired him very much. And he was being turned into a sort of joke figure, the dotty peer, sort of lunatic peer wandering around saying uh, things which they made sound ridiculous. The newspapers would do it, do it as an entertainment feature. It's not news, repeating like a chant, evil wire, week after week for 30 years. And that's quite something out of the ordinary in anybody's journalism. I think it would be just shameful to keep quiet and do nothing when you see this degree of injustice. It's the injustice is in one word. I mean, this woman cannot get the same treatment as an ordinary murderer. She cannot be treated as an ordinary lifer. She gets worse treatment than that. She's denied privileges, and that's all due to the press hounding her. And that is means she cannot, she's denied justice. Well, that is bad for everybody. To put her above all, but also everybody else. It is shameful to have a country in which you can do that. She had become a sort of national institution of hate. And I think very few people remembered Brady's name. Myra is troubled today by the fact that she can never make amends for the past. She will be constantly connected to Ian Brady. The crimes will always be at the forefront of um, people's minds when they refer to her. She is affected obviously, by the media attention. She is affected by the fact that she carries the burden of being Myra. A woman should have different instincts in a bloke, motherly love. I mean, it is, they are different from a fella, you know, and that makes it all the more horrifying that she, a woman was involved. Without her, Brady couldn't have taken those children away. He couldn't drive, he needed her. She was the one who lured them. They would go with a woman. Well, they wouldn't go with a man. Why my mother said that they wouldn't have gone if a woman hadn't been there. She is definitely the worst. Uh. The trial jury had found Myra Hindley not guilty of the murder of John Kilbride, but the families had warned their children against strange men, not strange women. Leslie Ann Downey went to the fair on Boxing Day 1964 and never came home. Twenty years on, in 1986, there were still two children missing. The police were about to go back to the unsolved mysteries of the Moors murders. The file on the Moors murders was never closed. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley denied it, but police were sure the pair knew about two more children missing since the 60s. Pauline Reed, 16, who vanished on her way to a dance, and 10-year-old Keith Bennett. A quarter of a century passed, and then Myra Hindley got a letter from Manchester. Dear Miss Hindley, I'm sure I'm one of the last people you would expect to receive a letter from. I'm the mother of Keith Bennett who went missing and no one knows where, on June the 16th, 1964. 
Please, I beg you, tell me what's happened to Keith. My heart tells me you know. I'm on bended knees, begging you to end this torture and finally put my mind at rest. At Cookham Wood Prison in Kent, reporters gathered to hear Myra Hindley's then solicitor read out her response. I received a letter, the first ever, from the mother of one of the missing children, and this has caused me enormous distress. In spite of 22 years' passage of time, I have searched my heart and memory and given whatever help I can to the police. I'm glad at long last to have been able to, to have been given this opportunity and I will continue to do all that I can. I hope that one day people will be able to forgive the wrong I've done and know the truth of what I have and have not done. But for now, I want the police to be able to conclude their inquiries, so ending public speculation and the private anguish of those directly involved. The Moore's murders, of course, had always fascinated me as, um, as a police officer, but uh, particularly because I'd been born and brought up in the Gorton district of Manchester where Myra Hindley uh, had lived and had been raised. So the reopening of the Moore's case was really to try and resolve the mystery of those two missing children and to put at rest the minds of the families of uh, Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. I went to see uh, Myra Hindley and I appealed to her for help and in doing that I asked her if she would consider pointing out to me first of all on maps and photographs places which were of uh, special interest to Ian Brady. Places of special interest to Ian Brady. That was what she offered the police as they launched their full-scale search of Saddleworth Moor in the late autumn of 1986. Myra Hindley still claimed she was innocent of the murders. She still said she knew nothing about the missing children. She still blamed Ian Brady. Then Peter Topping told the press Britain's most notorious woman prisoner was going to come out of jail to help him search the moor in person. Given the amount of area that we have to search, if somebody can come along and say, you want to loop there, that's, that's going to be enormously helpful. Five o'clock this morning, police blocks across all roads leading to Saddleworth Moor. The Home Office had finally agreed Myra Hindley could return to the moors. The helicopter on the video is uh, a Met Police helicopter and uh, the Metropolitan Police very kindly allowed us to use it to bring Hindley up from the south to, to Saddleworth Moor. The press had had helicopters from right from day one, they'd been using them to, to film what we were doing. Uh, and whilst we put a number of decoy parties out on the moor that day, it didn't take them an awful long time to, to discover which, which of the groups on the moors, the search party, was the one with Hindley in it. There we are, the, the three there in the centre of the, the shot. Uh, Mary Hindley is the one closest to the, to the camera. Uh, we had terrible problems. At one stage we had one or two press helicopters over us, uh, hovering very, very close to the ground, very low indeed. Uh, and of course we asked the Met helicopter to come up and, and look after the space above us, the airspace above us, and quite frankly at one stage it, it looked more like the Battle of Britain than Saddleworth Moor, it was uh, an appalling situation really. Do you personally believe she really does know something, or is she just enjoying the publicity and hoping maybe time, she'll time get will her own? Time will tell, but there is no bargain or negotiation with Mara Hindley at all. So this will have no effect on her parole? No, she's in custody, she'll stay in custody. It was clear by the end of that long and chaotic day that Myra Hindley would not be rewarded for her help to the police. The woman who was driven back to the south that night had been 21 years in prison protesting her innocence. But inside Cookham Wood Prison, Myra Hindley made a secret confession. For the first time, she admitted that she drove the cars. She helped to abduct the children, and she helped Brady to clear up afterwards. The confession was made in confidence to her counsellor, Peter Timms. And I think she blocked a lot of it out. It's much, much too painful, much too awful, really. And it's only as she began to talk, talk about it to me that she really was talking to herself about it, too. So she was almost confessing to herself for the first time, I think.
that it was it had really happened and there were lots of tears and lots of sadness the confession of Myra Hindley was very revealing it was though she was reading from a prepared script she could go back and correct and adjust things I think she was very careful in what she said particularly in respect of her own role in those murders she was always if you like um, in the car over the brow of the hill in the bathroom she was never there when it happened it happened according to her this moor is quiet we're here now the silence you can almost hear on occasions she was but a few yards away but could never give any details of of sounds that she heard hitherto of course we must remember that she I was saying that she was innocent not being involved that confession shows her in a totally different light it shows her to be somebody who callously went out to abduct children knowing what was going to happen to them knowing that they were going to be abused and murdered the confession she made under caution to Peter Topping became public in the spring of 1987 she still denied she'd actually killed anyone even so, for some of her friends, it was a devastating blow. When I read the newspapers in 1987, where Myra Hindley took the, uh, Mr. Topping to the moors to show them exactly where the bodies were, I screamed to the top of my voice. I absolutely freaked out. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, right, she's conned me, she's conned Lord Longford, She's gotten an officer six years imprisonment. Uh, everything she's told me, she is just a pathological liar and a very, very convincing liar at that. And I'm afraid I cried my eyes out. She only confessed because she wants her freedom at any cost. But the truth is quite different than that. The truth is quite the opposite to that. It didn't suit her purposes. But to, com to confess, why? To face the possibility of, of a, a new trial for murder? Why? And I believe why, because she'd come to a point in her life where, for whatever reason within herself, she wanted to do what she'd hoped she'd had done 20 years earlier. And she made that difficult step into the truthfulness of facing what happened. I know that the parents of the missing children may never be able to forgive me and that no words of mine can express the remorse I now feel for what I did and my refusal for so long to admit to the crime. And then when she wrote to me, I actually got the letter into my hand and it said that uh, she was very sorry but she was involved in Keith's murder with Brady and would uh, I possibly forgive her for what she's done? Which I wrote back to her and told her that I couldn't do because that what she's taken from me it's not just from me, but from my family and all. I just remember, you know, what my mum saw me. And I uh, kept asking her to use a picture. You know, Keith's picture, who was that? And it took 20 years for them to come forward and say that they murdered him. Which is a part, part of my life gone. I could never, never turn around and say, all right, Myra. You've come clean, I forgive you for that. I couldn't do that. For what she's done to them kids, it's in the back of my mind all the time. For Peter Topping, the pressure was relentless. A year into his controversial search, he still hadn't found a body. And he was puzzled about her motives for confessing. I had to ask myself, um, why had she waited so long to make this confession? Did she do it? purely out of uh, a reason to help the families, or did she do it uh, out of her own self-interest to try and secure a better image of herself for parole? I do believe that whilst she had some interest in relieving the suffering of the families, she also had a personal interest in wanting the graves and the, of those two children found and the bodies recovered, because once that had happened, the case would then effectively close. The case never has been closed. But then, in July 1987, they did find something. A white shoe. And then a body.
Well, naturally, I thought, I'm, I mean, I'm not half selfish, don't get me wrong. I thought it'd be Keith. I was hoping to God it'd be Keith. Because at least I got that, for that moment in time, I got that relief that, oh, he's found I can have him buried. For my family's sake and my, my own sake. And once I get him buried, it's a, an episode that's ended. It hadn't ended. It wasn't Keith Bennett they found. It was Pauline Reed, who hadn't been seen since 1963 and was now confirmed as the very first victim of the Moors murderers. Well, it was just one living up all the time, thinking she'd come home. And I, I was sat with my coat on for about three months, waiting for daylight to come through now to see if I could find her. I was just crying and crying and thinking about what had happened in my mind. And I kept thinking about it, and I couldn't sleep through thinking about it, and it built up and built up, and I think that's what caused it, the nervous breakdown. I was in hospital, and I remember my husband saying that Pauline had been found. I remember them I had two nurses brought me home to the funeral. I remember everything about the funeral, everything. I, rem I remember following the coffin and she was, she was of the flowers and I remember people putting flowers on, throwing flowers down and I remember putting the dust on Pauline and put me a flower on. Well, it was as years went on that I was saying my prayers about it and it seemed to lift me like a cloud come you know, like a cloud lifting off my shoulders and I began to feel more pleasant about it. Although I never forgot it, I never forgot it any day. Even now, I think about it every day. And the way she had to go. It's never to be forgotten, that. Never. And I know how Mrs. Johnson feels and I know how she'll feel if, if ever she did find Keith which yeah, what she does. The police never did find Keith. But before they abandoned the dig, Peter Topping brought Winnie Johnson to the moor. He'd interviewed Ian Brady as well as Myra Hindley. And he told Mrs Johnson some of what he'd learned. He took me through the moor and showed me where they dug. And he said, well, Keith was a picked up at random. Now, Brady and in there had the car on the top there. Brady walked down through the, the gully and he took him down the stream. And Keith asked, he said, oh, it's nice up here. My mum like, my mum would like it, she'd come up here. And he said, I'll have to go now because my mum will be looking for me. And that was, I think that was actually when he killed him. The Greater Manchester Police won't close the file on this case until the body of Keith Bennett has been found. But I do have to say that they have done everything that, that possibly could be done to try and find that body. I think that the confessions that Myra Hinley made to me in 1987 are going to be very significant um, now that the Home Secretary has got to make a decision as to her future parole. Um, I, in my own view, I don't think that they put her in a, a very good light at all. Yes, she committed some awful things. Yes, she was part of those awful murders 28, 29, 30 years ago, and she's paid an awful price for that. But that doesn't ever justify a society or a government or a people treating one person totally differently to other life sentence prisoners. That, I believe, is happening, and that I believe to be fundamentally wrong.
Today, when Myra Hindley thinks of freedom, she can think of Hampstead Heath in London. The governor of Holloway Prison once controversially brought her for a walk here. Looking back on that infamous time when Myra was brought up onto the heath, um, for the only taste of freedom she's had in, in the years that she's been incarcerated, um, as you can see, the, the views from here are fantastic. And um, it gave her a sense of, of freedom and also a sense of purpose for the future. It's still very much her dream for the future to be given that privilege once again. Joe Chapman believes he knows Myra Hindley's state of mind. Once a week in his own time, he travels from Leicestershire to counsel the women at Cookham Wood Prison. Like it or not, Myra has a future. But at this moment in time, that future hangs in the balance. Myra is on tenterhooks at the moment. She, more than anyone else, is waiting for the decision from the Home Office concerning the immediate future, whether her tariff will be natural life or whether it will be a fixed term of years. Um, obviously, at this moment in time, her, her biggest anxiety is how are the people that judge her at this moment in time judging her? Are they making a decision on Myra as she is now, on the work she's done while she's been in prison, or are they making a decision based on the past and based on, obviously, obviously public opinion. This morning on Kilroy, we're discussing Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley. And we'd like public opinion is unforgiving. The Kilroy audience in 1989 voted 15 to 1 to keep her inside forever. And of course, we want to hear your views. Daniel, pass me that box down, please. Right, this is just one of the boxes of petitions we did in 1987 to keep my in prison. The only refusals I did get was two at the time, and there was both wearing dog collars, priests, apparently. I think public opinion is the most important thing. 99% of people was in favour of the petition because it, it stands for itself that it was asking for sheets to take back home with them to America, Canada, all over the world, and they was posting, actually posting them to me with hundreds of signatures on them. I mean, these are just a few of... We stopped, we stopped counting when we got into the, you know, the hundreds of thousands. It's just, you know, we'd, we'd done enough. Lynch law, mob, mob rule, that's what she's getting. Because there's an angry crowd, therefore she should be hung or drowned or buried in a deep hole. That's what they used to do to witches, by the way. They had special dark places under castles where they put the witches. And that's what the public would like done to her, but that is grotesque and unfair, and, and somebody should object that. Well, do you approve of it? It doesn't seem to be something one can approve of. Michael Howard's decision is imminent. It will be based on a careful reading of judges' opinions, parole board recommendations, and of the public mood. It's a lawyer's problem, but it will have a politician's solution. A state of affairs Mr. Howard defends. Of course, full weight is given to the opinion of uh, both the trial judge uh, and the Lord Chief Justice, but the final decision in these cases is a matter for the Home Secretary. I am pessimistic with this present Home Secretary. He has said that one of the factors he must take into account is what does the um, public want and what do they expect when it comes to releasing certain prisoners and he says that public concern and public interest in this is a factor which he must take into account and this is a new factor which has never been um, considered by home secretaries before when coming to decide should a prisoner be released the government should abide by what the public want and it speaks for itself if the public are not getting what they want off the government they don't vote for them they're out of office the next term i don't think it's unfair at all I think that she's living out a, a, uh, a cruel fate imposed on the very cowardly politicians. The parole board reported years ago that Myra Hindley is a reformed character, no longer a danger to society. Today, she lives a quiet life behind the wire in Cookhamwood Prison. Her health is not good. She suffers from angina. But she makes tea for the governor. She tends the flowers and pot plants. 
She has an open university degree in humanities, and she has become a devout Catholic. I remember the day I met Myra Hindley for the first time, walking up those stairs towards her, remembering the images that I'd had in my mind ever since I was a young lad. I remember my mother switching off the, the television, you know, I'm the eldest of five children, I remember switching off the television uh, because of all the details coming out about the horrific uh, Moore's murders. And I remember thinking, even at that time, this woman must be the devil incarnate. There's no other way. And so all of that was part of my own story, part of my history. And when I met her, I found somebody quite different. Somebody had obviously uh, changed, somebody a lot older. She was 51 then. She's now 52. Um, and it was quite a surprise to see uh, somebody, and not just to, to meet her, but to give her Holy Communion. And suddenly I was here, I was blessing her, but in a strangely and, and, and paradoxical kind of way, there was a great sense of the power of God's grace, of, of God's presence. That was, it was quite a moment, a moment I won't forget. I think if you were to meet Myra, my opinion is that you would like her. The thing that impressed me is that she holds very good eye contact. She listens intently to what people say. She cares about what people say. And I suppose for me, um, as importantly, and, and why shouldn't she have this, she has a sense of humour. And she's able to make people feel at ease. Is she? I don't care to know her. She's done what she's done. Whether she's repented or not, she's done it and she should pay the price for doing it. And that means life imprisonment. She's not missing out on anything as far as I can see. Only our forgiveness and our freedom. And that will never come, that. I'm not, I'm not violent. But something like that would make me violent. Without any doubts, if I ever got the chance, I would do it. And the rest of my family would. If I actually come face to face with Barry Ridley, she's just dead. At Myra Hindley's old school in Manchester, generations of children have come and gone in the years since her imprisonment. Their notorious old girl has passed into the shared memory of her country as a powerful image of feminine evil. The idea of a bad woman who can hurt you when you're a child is the most frightening thing you can imagine because every one of us starts by being totally at the mercy of a woman, totally dependent on her, and that she should turn out to be bad, and your enemy is the most terrifying feeling. I think there lies in all of us a funny feeling that a wicked woman is worse than a wicked man. I think that's what the belief in witchcraft amounts to. And I think it, uh, 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 there's a feeling that particularly a woman doing anything harmful to a child is particularly alarming to people. Uh, but I think uh, she would not be the object of so much hatred if it hadn't been for what I call the Myra industry, which is the quarter of a century of journalistic campaigning against her, which is without precedent in British journalism. No one in this country ever has been kept in prison deliberately, so that in the sense, until they died, so that life meant life. People have, plenty of people have died in prison, of course, but um, that, uh, if life meant life, if, if, if the Home um, Secretary introduced that idea that life should mean life, well, that would be something new and abominable in Britain. You'd be halfway back to capital punishment. The heart of the Christian message is, is about change. It's about new beginnings. That's the meaning of the resurrection. It's about hope. And I think, in so many ways, Myra Hindley focuses that belief that we have as Christians, that there is always hope, that there is always the possibility of change, that there is always the chance of a new beginning. I'm a forgiving person, but not in this case, I'm afraid I just can't. I don't think any parent could. It is a life sentence because until I die, those memories will be in my mind and they're not nice memories, they're terrible memories. I mean, they just don't forget, no matter how long, just don't forget. 
hours to the end of our days and so should hers be. She shouldn't be released. She said to me, if only I could turn the clock back, but I can't, and none of us can. Let me tell you what she said uh, in a letter to me some, some time ago now, about six or seven years ago. I want to be free. It's become a painful yearning now, but I keep that to myself, because then I'd be able to seek solace from the haunting memories easier than I can do in here, when the door is locked for the night. The letter touches me because I think it's a genuine expression of our inner being, of the real Myra Hindley. Mara Hindley spent her girlhood in the same Manchester back streets as some of the dead children. Thirty years later, almost none of these streets remain. For the families, only grief endures. And for Myra Hindley, an elusive dream of freedom. She should never set me set free. Our children are not free. They, they, deserve to have, they, they deserve to have lived in this world. And I hope the Home Secretary keeps Mara Hindley locked up, keeps, him locked, keeps her locked up and never lets her out again. She doesn't deserve it. I simply object that this, this woman is not being given British justice like other prisoners. She's not getting the same treatment as other prisoners. That's the whole story. And that needs to be said. Myra Hindley has made no public comment for seven years. Now she has sent this personal statement to Channel 4. Words are inadequate to express my deep sorrow and remorse for the crimes I have committed and the pain they have caused. But after 30 years in prison, I think I have paid my debt to society and atoned for my crimes. I ask people to judge me as I am now and not as I was then. Dreadful as my crimes were, I hope that the Home Secretary will take account of the very unusual circumstances in which I became involved in those crimes. I explained this to the police fully in 1987, and my solicitor has set it out in a recent letter to the Home Secretary. The family of the lost boy, Keith Bennett, still search for his body. Winnie Johnson's surviving sons come up here regularly to dig. My sons come up here every other Sunday when it's fine, provided the weather's fine, and they dig for him. Coppers won't do it, so we've got to do it now. Well, this is it. Until he's found him. It's not really going to be done, is it? No, I'm fine. It is hopeless, but I mean, it's a thing that they've got to do. For my sake and for their sake and all of them, it's on this sake. Do you think really we'll ever find him, Joy? Of course we will. Do you think so? It'll take a while. It's set some years ago, don't you think? I can't think so. 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 I can't think so